All right, just some quick housekeeping rules. Um, well, not even really housekeeping, but if you live, uh, live translation is on, if you need closed captioning, uh, you should be able to look at the toolbar at the bottom of your screen, I believe. Um, you should see a big closed caption button. If you do not, then go ahead and click uh, the three dots with the word more under it, um, and you'll be able to then uh, turn on uh, subtitles or closed captioning that way. Um, this is for anybody who needs it. Uh, so if you still uh, cannot find it, just go ahead and drop it in the chat and I will try to assist you that way. You see me looking off to the sides because I'm pulling the little devil duty here. Uh, I'm going to try to talk to you all. And when the time comes, drop in some important links about some great stuff that we have going on at CSTA, um, you know, and all of that. The very first link I'm going to drop because we are now at the seven o'clock hour um, Eastern, six o'clock Central. I am going to drop in the link to this presentation um, so that, you know, uh, links and things that uh, pop up and I talk about. And just if you wanted to see the presentation again itself, you will be able to. So give me one second. That is the link to the presentation. So let's get started. Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much. Uh, we are here for Cybersecurity Awareness Month and to share some resources. Um, this is a part of the professional learning series by CSTA. Um, really appreciate it. I'm just going to quickly introduce myself. My name is Dr. Daquan Bashir. Uh, I am the new one of the newly minted uh, professional learning managers for CSTA. Uh, I am also uh, doing some work with the Microsoft Philanthropies Teals program as a regional manager specialist. Um, in my former life, I was a computer science educator and uh, mathematics here in New Jersey for about 11 years. Um, so that's a bit about me. And of course, why we are all here. As I said before, at the top of the hour, we are here for a Cybersecurity Awareness Month um, to celebrate and to talk about uh, certain topics that can help us in our daily practices as educators, uh, you know, as teachers, and, um, you know, just to have some great information about cybersecurity and to hear from some great panelists who are going to talk to us about cybersecurity as well. So what you see on the screen now is just uh, to kind of ground us all in where we want to start um, and why we are all here and, you know, to, to really ground this conversation. Um, here at CSTA, we really want to make sure that uh, uh, educators and folks know what students are expected to learn. So here on the screen, you can see that they, there are cybersecurity standards. Um, it is a subset of the overall computer science standards, but you can still access them. Um, and you can see here that they have standards from K all the way to 12, right? So students will be able to uh, uh, go into cybersecurity education and have standards that they are learning to. So now I am going to introduce our lovely moderator. She's going to be moderating this conversation for us as we are talking to the panelists. Um, and her name is uh, Alana Robinson. Um, and while I am introducing you, Alana, if you just want to go ahead and uh, make yourself live if you haven't just yet, um, so Alana is an eighth grade special education technology and computer science teacher at a special education public school in New York City. Uh, she's been teaching technology and computer science since uh, 2015 um, as part of the New York City CS for All. Uh, and she was a teacher, is a teacher for CS for All. Um, and she's currently in her 20th year of uh, teaching as a public school uh, special education educator. Um, she's also pursuing a New York uh, State uh, Advanced Certification in Computer Science for K-12. So please, everybody, let's welcome Alana. Thank you so much for moderating this discussion for us. Thank you. That was lovely, Daquan, Dr. Bashir. I really appreciate it. And I just want to welcome everyone, educators, industry folks. Um, we really appreciate you. This is going to be a great panel. We have a lot of 
very experienced folks that are in the room that are going to be talking to us about um, cybersecurity, something that I think we're all passionate about and we live it every single day using technology. So um, without further ado, I will, we see our pictures, right? Everyone's picture on the screen right now. So I'm just going to introduce everyone. Um, so we have Allison Bilak to our left. And Allison is a supervising associate at Ernst & Young in uh, technology. She is working within the Information Security Organization as part of the Cyber Threat Intelligence Team. Um, her current role involves protecting Ernst & Young's information against security threats by identifying the critical and priority threats to the firm by collecting and analyzing information on threats and producing threat intelligence to assess the potential impact of the threat. She's also delivering both strategic and tactical analytical assessments. Previously, Allison held both private and public sector positions working within the intelligence um, analysis field. And Allison is a graduate of Mercyhurst University and an avid member of the Junior League of Albany outside of work. Thank you so much, Allison. We appreciate your participation in this panel. And our next esteemed panelist is Nefertari Strickland. She is a cyber technology um, strategist and teacher. And as you see, Allison is also a supervising um, associate at Ernst & Young Technology. So Nefertari is a military officer. In addition to being a cyber technology strategist, she's a military officer and adjunct professor who aligns with her communities through emerging technology initiatives in the K through 20 um, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics education STEAM. She has a Bachelor of Arts in Mass Communications from Savannah State University. She has a Master of Professional Studies in Information Assurance and Cybersecurity from the Pennsylvania State University and industry certifications as a certified ethical hacker. My students would love to meet you. That's all they talk about is hacking. And I try to push them in the ethical branch, not the other way. So you are certified as an ethical hacker. Um, you're also certified as a project management professional, PMP and you're certified in information system security professional, CIS, and a certificate in higher education teaching from Harvard University's Derek Box Center. <laughs> and um, Nefertari, also as a communications officer, you are, you are in the Pennsylvania Army National Guard. You direct the integration of fire support assets for combined arms operations. And at the start of the 20, 20 uh, COVID pandemic, you launch teachers and the design and disrupt community to support education stakeholders so they can navigate the future of education. So you are, your loving husband with two amazing children reside in the greater Philadelphia region where you serve as an adjunct professor in blockchain technology at St. Joseph's University and a lecturer at the Wharton School of Business. So that's our second panelist and our last panelist, Mr. Nico Smith. He is a cybersecurity professional and also a member of Soldiers and Saints. So Nico is um, also known as SOX. We're gonna have to ask him to talk about that, but at, not at this moment. He's commissioned through the University of Illinois at Chicago ROTC in, in 2009, and he received the BFA in graphic design and web technology from Columbia College. Nico's experience includes red cell team leader against the national security agency blue team and red team exercise lead for the cyber shield exercise control and lead for the 169th cyber protection team where he developed the only functioning cyber challenge coin in the Department of Defense. In his civilian role with the Army Cyber Command, Nico volunteers about 30 hours a month to college and high school students interested in gaining entry into the cyber career field. He is committed 
to improving cybersecurity and changing the way cyber is understood, leveraged, and cultivated. Um, as the founder of Soldiers and Saints, which is a charitable foundation, Nico is a developing, he's developing a cyber sandbox capability to educate, train, and develop the next generation of cybersecurity scholars. Welcome to you all. We really appreciate you um, taking some time out this evening. So we are going to start with um, the first question is going to be for our panelist one, which is Allison. So how has the field of cybersecurity um, evolved in the last 10 years? I think this is a, a great question and definitely a, a loaded question. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll try my best to, to answer it. Um, but I think it has evolved greatly in both, you know, the types of threats that we're seeing and the response that's required to mitigate those threats. Mm -hmm. A lot of what I do um, in cyber threat intelligence is analyzing threats and it's taken, you know, we're constantly, you know, forward looking, but I think it's also important to look at how far we've come in the last 10 years and this decade has definitely made companies rethink their cybersecurity strategies. We've seen a drastic, you know, evolution with the cloud, IoT devices. Mm -hmm. Our networks are vulnerable in ways they never were before, maybe 10 years ago. And with these changes, we're also seeing um, threat actors or cyber criminals evolving at, you know, sometimes an equal pace, sometimes a more advanced pace. Um, this includes, you know, ransomware. We've seen 2017 WannaCry ransomware to present day with, you know, complex networks of affiliate-based programs that are both state funded by nation states, as well as, you know, individuals operating out of their parents' basements. So um, we're also seeing um, I touched a little bit on state-sponsored, but threat actors from Russia, Iran, North Korea, China, they continue to become more and more advanced with, you know, supply chain compromises. I'm sure we've all seen um, some pretty big ones in the last couple of years, mm -hmm. as well as the exploitation of security weaknesses. So these changes that we're seeing in the wild and within the field specifically I think directly correlates to the need for cybersecurity professionals and you know almost every industry is at a a need to hire more and more people and I think this will kind of continue it definitely continue as the field continues to expand and change in the in the near to long term I think we're in a constant evolution every 10 years we're going to see more and more change Wow, that's really fascinating. I was so excited about this panelist that I kind of jumped the gun a little with um, with the order of the questions. We actually, I apologize, we actually need to just have a question to all of us, to everyone, which is, um, what was your first exposure to cybersecurity? But Allison, you won't have to repeat because that, that was a lot and that was really fascinating. Um, but just we want to kind of double back and go and just get a sense of, you know, how did we all get introduced to cybersecurity and our first exposure to cybersecurity? So I will, as you continue, Allison, we'll start with you and uh, go from Allison to then Nefertari and then to Nico. Okay, I will, I will keep it short and sweet. So my exposure to cybersecurity was very limited in um, my education from K through 12, that wasn't um, an offering that I had within my school district. It's mm -hmm. great to see that that's now being incorporated. I had uh, my first exposure, I would say professionally later in life, I was working physical security and alongside physical security, um, you know, cybersecurity mirrors a lot of the threats that um, that poses. So I kind of transitioned into cybersecurity into the field that I am in today. Um, 
Yeah, my, my first exposure was probably five years ago or so professionally. Thank you. You want me just to jump in? <laughs> yes. Alana, I could, yes. I could jump in. I could, I could do it. that. <laughs> I could do that. What was um, your first exposure? <laughs> Well, so very similar to Allison, cybersecurity wasn't an offering when I was going through mm -hmm. uh, K-12 education or my undergraduate, right? Mm. Um, I would say that my first awareness of the need for cybersecurity was the Max Headroom hack of a television satellite station that some people saw, right? I was a big Max Headroom fan. Yeah, uh, yeah so they, mm -hmm. they hacked the first you know, satellite feed, right? So I'm like, wow. But, um, you know, without the label of cybersecurity, because um, prior to cybersecurity, we referred to it as information assurance, was actually through the military. I joined the National Guard at the age of 17. And so before I was driving, I was, you know, working alongside other service members in uh, communications. And so uh, networked telephones, networked computers, uh, but air gaps not connected to an internet uh, is my first exposure. And at the time, uh, there's a lot of precedence that was set that we still abide by today. So if you think about like information dominance and information warfare, that era of the late 90s is, is when a lot of that um, doctrine, as we call it, started to really emerge and federal policy and, and legislators really started to think about um, how being connected globally could affect the nation and the security of the nation. But I believe that the commercialization of the internet um, made it where it seemed like it was fun. It seemed like it was for commerce and we forgot about the security of it. But all along as service members, which I'm sure Nico will tell you too, that's always a security, physical security first, Allison, right? But uh, that security is something that, that we always have in our, in our plans and at top of mind. Thank you. And Nico, how were you introduced to cybersecurity? Wow, um, it's very interesting uh, because it ties into socks. Um, grew up, I'm like all the other panelists, um, cybersecurity as it stands today wasn't available, but you know, IT was sort of growing legs uh, because we had uh, servers and systems out there. Um, didn't have a computer in the house, um, but uh, saw some some really really cool neat uh, movies like Sneakers or, or Hackers, and uh, really really fell in love with the with the idea of what could be done with uh, with a telephone line. You know, we're talking you know 9600 baud, and nobody else can talk on the phone when <laughs> when you're on the internet with you know CompuServe and things like that. Um, really wanted to impress girls in school, right? And thought it would be really neat if I could um, perhaps change some grades in the school. I uh, thought that that would be really, really good idea. Um, so a friend of a friend introduced me into uh, some people on, on a bulletin board. And uh, they were like, hey, just Western Union us, you know, 50 bucks and 50 bucks in the eighties was a lot of money, right? So I'll find a way Western Union over this money guys who I've never met before, but I mean, someone locally, uh, they ended up taking them. You know, they took it and I never heard from them again. Uh, fast forward, maybe six months later, on another bulletin board, chatting up, uh, end up meeting a, a group of people um, that were pretty active on the internet. Uh, just so happened that a few of the guys were in Niles, Illinois. I was in Chicago. I'm from Chicago. Uh, so, I, you know, I begged them and pleaded with them, like, please just teach me something. Give me anything. Uh, this is what I've learned how to do. And uh, they were going to ignore me, but I said, well, you know, I have, you know, I have like 60, you know, I have 60 email addresses with lives and, you know, they're, they're out there doing things like, you know, I, I'll give you like 20 of them if you, you know, if you just teach me a few things. So the guy says, oh, so you're a sock farmer? I'm like, it's a sock farmer. 
and they like they're laughing like i'm getting flamed back back in the day it was it was wild so flaming to to uh to the audiences uh when you're getting talked about when when people are shouting derogatory terms at you on keyboard uh, so i get flamed and so the two guys decided like all right well we'll teach you a little little something and uh this is back before backtrack and uh, i learned a little bit of stuff got involved in a few things and then uh, really got excited about um, how um, I could almost get all the information that I need for reports and things like that at the uh, from behind this giant green tube or or this terminal. Uh, it was better than playing uh, uh, better than playing Oregon Trail. You know, it, there were other things that you could do with this, and uh, I started learning like, hey, I could actually access. Uh, the school computer uh, uh, internet and how interesting that was that it wasn't just a myth or something that you had to be super, you know, um, super dedicated to uh, for some things, but other things just I think the, the curiosity kind of drove me and inspired me to um, to get involved. It kind of freed me from from going home to the, you know, to the neighborhood, you know. That's that's my first exposure, and that's where I got socks from. Beautiful tie, and now we know the story. That socks. Thank you yeah. so much. So, um, and you know, just like you guys, I too never was formally trained in um, cybersecurity when we were growing up, and even I really only learned about the term when I started teaching it, which was in 2015, um, and that. But we knew about like making sure you have a good password for your login, but it didn't have that umbrella term of cybersecurity. So I think it's, you know, we've come a long way. It's great. Like in my, you know, our school in the public school in New York City, it's literally from K all the way to 12th grade. My school is special ed. All the students are learning about cybersecurity and um, how to be safe online and create strong passwords. And they do know, they love hacking. They like to use that word, but I think um, it would be great to have maybe you as a speaker, <clears throat> Nefertari, where they get a better sense of what that really means. But let's move forward. I'm sorry, I'm kind of digressing. We will go to what skills do you guys think should be kind of essential for students to have today if they want to pursue um, either studying cybersecurity or a career in cybersecurity? We'll start with Allison and then go to Nefertari and then we go. So I think the skill set depends on a lot of times what discipline of cybersecurity you want to go into. I know when I first heard the, the word cybersecurity, I kind of related it to the medical field and it's so vast and there's so many different little niches. I think the skill sets, at least that I see in the professional workplace, are definitely uh, kind of vary. I would say within, I'll speak to cyber threat intelligence, um, the skill sets that, you know, we're always looking to hire people that have include critical thinking. That's, uh, I would say number one. Um, soft skills are also very important. Um, you know, communication, the ability to be comfortable public speaking. I can't tell you the number of, you know, coworkers that I have that are still, you know, years into their career and are very uncomfortable with the thought of, you know, getting up in front of a decision maker or an, even another internal team and, you know, struggle with that. Um, and I would also say, not a skill set, but kind of the ability to be a lifelong learner. It kind of goes back to, you know, cybersecurity as a whole, it's constantly changing. Um, before I kind of transitioned into this field, the thought of doing a certification or, you know, spending time studying was like, oh, no, like not something I ever thought I would be, you know, enjoying or doing, but just being in this field, it's, so critical and so important to have that desire to continue to learn and um, whether it's you know taking a SANS course or learning a new programming language that we're seeing be adopted by threat actors 
kind of the list goes on. So I would definitely say that's a high, highly critical um, component to be successful within the, the cyber field. I agree. I absolutely agree with the, the points that Allison uh, made, the, the critical thinking, the soft skills. Um, many of us refer to them as, as power skills, really important uh, to be able to communicate and articulate and listen, right? There's so many people that aren't very good listeners. So I'd add to that tact. It's a, a skill they can acquire, right? Um, often we have to uh, communicate information that's not fun, sometimes painful uh, to people that outrank us or that are superiors, but we need to be able to do that in such a way that they can hear us, right? But that we can give them the information that they need to make the decisions that, uh, that they're paid to make, right? I think it's also important to maintain a healthy imagination as we look at you know, cloud computing, a lot of the virtualization, like these aren't tangible things, right? You need to be able to visualize what's happening. And strategic thinking is, is what I want to say, but that's not always a skill set a young person has the ability to develop without a considerable training. So for them, I would say the ability to, to color outside the lines, but not too much, right? We want them to be able to think like a hacker. We want them to think like their adversary, right? And be able to maintain that because it's so valuable on the good guy side of the house. So that's what I'll add. Nico, you're up. Nico. <laughs> There's nothing left for you, Nico. I, I know you guys have taken out all, all of the great gems. Uh, I, I, I have to second uh, Nefertiri's um, uh, her points as well as Allison's. Uh, I will say this. Um, cybersecurity is one of the only fields you can go into that everyone fits in. So if you're an artist, there's work for you, steganography. That's you know hiding messages in your in your um, in your picture photo or or just changing the way that people think. So for those people who are more spatial thinkers and uh, and are less strict on on how they approach things, there's a lot of value add there. Um, if we can find the if we can find the joy and the uh, the the interest in the mundane like so being prepared and preparing um uh I, I say children hack every day i'll show you how in the classroom there there used to be a rule for going to the bathroom you had to raise your hand and you'll probably go to the bathroom maybe twice in a in a sitting period well how many children do you know that go to the bathroom multiple times during a, a classroom session? That's thinking outside the box. That's hacking. That's transforming the environment to to work in such a way that you're able to understand and get what you want out of the situation. Um, I, I think that um, what children can can definitely uh, what what they'll need is is constant curiosity because that's what's going to enable that that next level that that next generation uh of change and and i'm pretty sure allison sees this when she's looking at current threat reports how unique the threat actors apply certain very normal and standard protocols in order to get what they want but that's all i have thank you that was very very revealing and i noticed from all of you, no one said anything about a programming language or a specific, um, I mean, what you're really describing is really making sure kids have certain soft skills and certain thinking skills, which is really great because I think we, many times as educators, you think a specific program or a language that they need in order to break in to some of these tech fields. And it's, we're realizing that it's, it's a combination of both. So we're going to go on um, to our second panelist. This question is for you, Nefertari. And it, how, what skills do you think would be um, essential? Sorry, 
how can teachers, that's really, how can, how do you think teachers can support students in building some of all of the conversation we're talking about in the soft skills, 20, whether it's 21st century skills, um, cybersecurity skills, how do you think we um, as educators can develop those skills in students and, you know, produce these cybersecurity um, products so they can be teaching and learning in these spaces? So I think there's a lot that I'm confident you're already doing. You're just not necessarily doing it together. You're not necessarily uh, working with some of your colleagues to develop interdisciplinary uh, curriculum or programming out of school time that helps young people understand that what they're doing in English class, right, relates to what they're doing in their tech program, right? To be able to um, write well uh, is a skill. To be able to write technically is a different type of skill, right? To be able to um, think through some of the longer term learning objectives, maybe from semester to semester, year to year, and how that might build from middle school to high school is something that only through collaboration can a uh, institution like a middle school or a school district um, bring about where then when the technical you know, programming language is laid on, it's a matter of, you know, we want to use Java or we want to use Python, but we're going to use it to develop this thing. The thing is what that collaboration um, is, it will foster, right? The tool that we choose to use to bring it about that, you know, that that's, it could be anything, right? And so that's why I believe that all three of us talked about skills that were not necessarily centered in a domain of computer science. That's, that's really eye-opening. <laughs> um, and for you, Nico, we have, in, in your opinion, um, what do you think can be done to expose more students to cybersecurity, what infrastructure mm -hmm. and things need to be in place to really level up it, kids being exposed to cybersecurity? Wow, I'm, I'm really glad that you asked me this question um, because it's one of my passions. Um, well, I think we start them off early um, and we race the idea of um, of of their capacity or projecting our interpreted um, um, thoughts on on what what they're capable of doing, and then we we introduce them to um, simple pro uh, problem projects like um, Scratch. Scratch is a is very active in the classroom. I hear uh, there's a lot of early adoption there. Um, and, and the way that you can transition from having the code versus pretty much drag and drop uh, pieces of code uh, and modular function, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, but I think uh, to, uh, to what Nefertiri was saying, uh, going across the, the disciplines, I definitely see value where um, there could be a a capture the flag based scenario. And for those of you who don't know what a capture the flag scenario is. I was just when, about to ask that. <laughs> that's when um, when you have an adversary, a pseudo adversary, and you have a, um, a good guy. And uh, the good guy is working towards trying to find out how the bad guy may have poisoned the environment or done something bad to the environment. And one of the ways that I enable those those type of functions is through um, the infrastructure that I have, um, where where I seek to bring people in and uh, and educate them on what bad looks like, so that you can be better prepared for uh, for moving forward. Um, and also, um, real fun real fun thing that I did in kindergarten, and I think even kindergarten to fifth grade. There was a time where we had to read or get a snippet out of the newspaper and and 
and read it or, or tell people something that you learned about the day. Well, we could easily in, in, in those classrooms that may not have those electronic resources that it takes to deal with Raspberry Pis or different automated systems, we can start off with like, hey, what 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 computer fact have you found for for the for the day or or for the week? Uh, and then identifying a student each, you know, each week that comes up and, you know, speaks on what they what they learned. I think we then start to get them into the mindset of what what cybersecurity can can look like, as well as playing card games. And and I think Nefteri knows exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, Cyber Threat Defender is, is doing some really amazing things uh, in that space with low uh, low bar of entry. Uh, but that's all I have. Very nice. I'm, I'm getting carpal tunnel from all the notes I'm taking from all of you right now. So this is amazing. Thank you so much. So this um, last question, well, not last question, but this kind of is really for everyone, this question. And it's, what are some ways that now, you know, we talked about how do we develop students and the infrastructure. So what do you think teachers can do um, that, that teachers can boost their knowledge? What are ways teachers can boost their knowledge about cybersecurity? And, or what do you think they can do to level um, and increase how to teach cybersecurity? So it's kind of a, a two part, like how do they develop the skill set about the cybersecurity? And then how do they then increase their knowledge in order to teach it? So, Allison. The first thing that comes to mind is something that I, I do as well is take advantage of resources. I know CSTA has um, quite a few resources that are available. Um, it's hard to sometimes, I know I'm guilty of it, set aside the time to, to do that. But even if you just walk off 30 minutes on a slow Friday afternoon to just you know, devote to your professional development. Um, I think it's beneficial in the long run to stay current and up to date. Um, I would also recommend tapping into alumni networks within your within your districts. There has to be at least at least one graduate that you can um, hopefully find and maybe bring them into the classroom to you know talk to your students, talk to you. Um, I think networking is a, is a great thing to take advantage of. And usually nine times out of 10, the, the people will be more than willing to help out, come back and um, you know, benefit their, their former alma mater. Thank you, Nefertari. Yeah, so I, um, I absolutely agree with, um, finding those who are willing to reach back into the institution. Some educators will have a student, their child, and maybe even the grandchild, right? You all, you all educate generations of uh, citizenry. And I'll say that, you know, not just alumni of the high school, but like your local college and uh, industry locally, government, uh, as everyone listening to this panel understands right now, cyber is one of the top priorities, if not nationally, globally. You know, the president just put forth a um, proclamation for Cyber Awareness Month, two-factor authentication, a password manager, complex password, you know, all of those things, right? Um, but there's also funding. And often the lack of funding I have seen in education be a barrier to the work that actually should be done. And then after the funding is solved, organization, like who, who has the capacity or the bandwidth to take on one more thing, because so many of us wear so many hats. So in cybersecurity, one of the things we talk about is baking in versus bolting on, right? Cybersecurity shouldn't be an afterthought. If you think of it as the locks and the controls that we put in place to keep what's valuable safe, you have to apply it to something. So what are we applying these controls to? 
And then focus on that because how that is planned for, acquired, maintained, and in some cases even destroyed is what cybersecurity actually is. So for teachers to prepare themselves, I think at the same time they prepare their students, as Nico was alluding to, I don't know if my virtual background is going to mess this up, but Cyber Threat Defender, if you haven't um, seen this, educators will get a 25 deck classroom set from the University of Texas at San Antonio. Um, I will drop that in the resource when it's called for, uh, but it doesn't require any power, it doesn't require an internet connection, and it's that low bar uh, to entry, as, as Nico had said, where the card game gamifies cybersecurity concepts and principles, right? And then thinking about how you can leverage career pathways, not necessarily all directed towards cyber, but what industries can you bring people into your learning environments to expose young people to that we know will lead to a more secure business or network. We have autonomous and electric vehicles coming online that we're not looking for engineers to design cars anymore. We're looking for computer programmers to design cars. But we know that the Tesla was hacked multiple times and they do uh, you know, a, a, a bug bounty often for things like that. So there, I don't think that there's an industry that's not touched by the need for um, a heightened or increased uh, security posture. It's you know, how do we massage this where it's not that one more thing, but it's something that's inclusive to our learning community and our greater community at large. Wow, thank you so much. That was very illuminating and Nico. Okay, so again, they've taken all the great answers. Um, so I'll try my very best. Um, so um, when I think about when I think about cybersecurity, I, I think about cybersecurity as a lifestyle more than a job. Um, it's transitioned from me being excited about uh, how things work to uh, it becoming something that I got actively in in my spare time to where the government found value enough to, to bring me in to lead soldiers into doing things like that. And then back on the civilian side, um, still empowering the mission. Um, so it what it really takes is for you to don it as as an everyday every everyday piece of uh, 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 everyday thing within your life, and because it's a thing that you do in your everyday, then it makes it easier for you to to uh, communicate that to your to your uh, students. It'll make it easier for you to understand these concepts and kind of boil it down, distill it into more. Um, more biteable, bite-sized uh, pieces of, of technology so that it becomes less less scary or or, um, or, or less of an issue to to um, to allocate time to educate yourself about. Um, I think that uh, educators, besides uh, engaging with uh, with the people that uh, both Navratri and and Allison uh, spoke on. Uh, I think teachers themselves could uh, find some joy and in, in, in even morale boosting and small competitions throughout the school of who can, you know, who can identify the most security threats in your environment. Uh, that pays off twice, right? You're, you're walking around, you saw somebody um, walk into the school piggybacking uh, uh, with you past security because they forgot their, their ID. Now, I'm not saying, you know, Hey, we're gonna rat out all our friends. I'm not saying that at all, but perhaps we find a way to gamify it because you know that is violation of the physical security, which is the first block from people like me to get into your space and to do things. Uh, of course, when hired and and ethically, right? So, um, so gamifying those things. Um, also. Um, When's the uh, when's the last time? Because you're educators. When I look at educators, I find them to be the smartest people on the planet because they create intelligent people. They they uh, nurture and enrich that, right? 
So I, my challenge to you educators is to take TikTok's user end user license agreement, terms of service. I want you guys to download it and read it. And after you read it, because you're you're educators, you'll you'll have good conversation. And then identify the security threats that that is inside the thing that your students are using every day. So then now you're a more informed group of people who are charged with watching my children. And perhaps you'll tell the other the other parents of these things, because they'll listen to you. You're you're the educator, right? So I mean that's an that's an opportunity for you to not only get a little bit more information, but to feel more comfortable with what you what you're looking at. And I guarantee you after you read that one, you're gonna want to read the other ones that you that you see um, when you tell your phone that it's okay for your microphone to be used with your calculator that you just downloaded, right? So um, that's that's the best thing that that uh, that I can provide. Wow, that's more than more than a couple. Thank you so much. This has been very very um, fantastic. Um, so. Dr. Bashir, uh, I think we are ready for Q&A. So if anyone would like to, um, the cyber threat defender, it seems to be getting a lot of, I think people want the, got, thank you, thank you. I, you read my mind. Thank you for putting, I was just about to ask if you can put it in the chat, beautiful. So we have that. Um, so anyone either would like to drop a, a question in the chat or if they would like to unmute and ask our very esteemed panelists questions. I have a question. Um, so I, <laughs> since no one would speak up, uh, so password is a, is a huge issue. Um, we all have to do passwords and create it and, you know, what's, what's the recommendation for one, um, teaching kids passwords that are safe, but also secure. And for me, I have an additional layer because my students have disabilities. And so while I keep it simple, one, two, three, four, I shouldn't even say the rest of this, because that is that's a barrier. I mean, using that allows them to use practice entering in their password and sign on, but it's not really creating a good habit. I know I'm not modeling a good habit by using that example as a password, but I'm giving them the entry to use these accounts because it's very easy and simple for them. So what would be your recommendation as I'm building their what I call cybersecurity, um, cybersecurity skills, what would be the recommendation for them for the next step um, so that they can start developing strong passwords and not following my example? Nico said he wants to go, I think. He said, ooh, me in the chat. So Allison, do you mind? Cause ooh, Nico. <laughs> Okay, okay. R real quick. Um, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, uh, which I don't think I am, uh, most password fields accept emojis. Uh, that's something that you can go toward, and it's a, it's a difficult thing uh, for people when they're um, pulling down password hashes to re uh, re put together passwords. Right. Um, second. Um, have them find, uh, um, because you're educators and this is a school environment, right? So we don't use passwords, we use passphrases. So open up your favorite book and find a phrase that they'll always remember. I'm, I'm, I, I remember um, from Things Fall Apart, like there's a, a excerpt there that I'll go to and I'm like, oh, okay, let me, you know, look at that one sentence. And it includes the complexity minus numbers 
Uh, you can add numbers, but just do sentence case. So enjoy, uh, include the spaces as well. And I think Nico, he brings up a really interesting point, right? So you're in English class, the, the, the phrase that I remember as a rose by any other name, not smell as sweet, you know? And so thinking about how you could pull from some of the literature uh, exercises or, you know, research and history dates and, and replace the numbers for letters or symbols, right? And someone just dropped something that Allison, is that you? You got to give your no, explanation. No, finish your thought before. <laughs> so I remember I saw this um, from a coworker years ago, and I'm a visual learner. So I saw this table, and it was very eye opening because if at the time my password probably would have been cracked within an hour or two. So I think if your students are visual learners, this is a great way to kind of rate where you stand and explain, you know, there are tools out there that make it really, really easy to crack passwords. So um, hopefully you're, you're not in the, the, the section of the graph that, just, that shows your password will be cracked instantly. But I think this would be a great visual to, to show your students too, if, if they're visual learners and um, see how they compare. Now, Lana, if, if I can, uh, there's a saying that it takes a carpenter and an architect to build a house, but it takes an idiot with a match to burn it down. If someone, re if, if someone really, really, really wants access to your network or to your, you know, crypto, if they really want access, they can get to it. So I would say on top of the techniques that we talked about, frequency mm -hmm. and changing the password is really important as well. Thank you. So are there any questions? Um, so in the chat, Brett says, just to clarify, is it best for students to develop the soft non-technical skills as opposed to preparing students for certifications, which traditionally has been part of career and technical education? Who wants to go? So I'll go. Okay. I got you next. <laughs> so certification, education, important. I can teach that to anyone. If you lack the ability, interpersonal skills to work with others, as this panel has shown, like and and that has shown itself in the difficulty that women have had to get into this space, right? Uh, that, that minorities and, and um, other people of color have had uh, in getting into this space. Um, it, there's a, there are not only visual differences, but cultural differences and obstacles that you're gonna have to uh, have to overcome. And I think that's why we, we um, prioritize the ability to work with others, because if I don't know something, and now that I know Allison exists in the world, I say, hey, Allison, I met you at this, that, and the other. Uh, I have a project that I'm looking at. I want to understand APT 23. And she may not give her give me the keys to the castle, but because of a, uh, a, an ability to create a relationship makes my job that much better and makes me as a person more efficient. Yes, you need certifications because, uh, I mean, people need them. But to be honest, my, fir my first entry into cybersecurity was purely on skill set. They, they, I had no certifications. I could just do. I didn't have certifications because they cost too much for me to go to school to, to procure. Um, and I didn't have the time. I needed to eat now. So um, I think that if there's importance that in uh, in the way that uh, the other panelists and myself uh, prioritize uh, the soft skills. That that's all. Not to dismiss the importance of the other. Thank you, thank you for that very nice answer, Nico. Um, and we have one question from Rachel, Rochelle Jones. I see your hand is up. Yes, uh, I have a question about um, 
um, thinking of cybersecurity, I know when we first all had to go to working remote, there were some, I saw some um, news articles about, you know, people working remotely at home, but not having the cybersecurity to keep the files encrypted at home, but yet you're doing work that involves people's social security numbers, things like that about people. So when you have people working remotely, is it the company's responsibility to make sure they have that the person at home has, um, um, I guess, the uh, network that's very secure, or is it the the worker and how do you know for sure they have it as a an employer? Thank you. So let me make sure I understand the question you're asking as an employee who is working from home. Is it your responsibility or the organization's responsibility to ensure that you can receive and tra uh, uh, transmit and receive data securely? Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. So both. <laughs> you you would hope that your employer would provide you with all of the tools that you need, but we are in many cases in a bring your own device environment, right? Um, we expect your home network to have a certain degree of, I think it's like WEP, uh, but a certain degree of security, but that's not going to necessarily protect the data in transit. Right, and that's why we expect vir uh, uh, virtual private networks or VPNs. Um, and if you are someone who is handling the data of others, their personally identifiable information, um, so security numbers, date of birth, um, driver's license numbers, you have a responsibility, right, not to send unencrypted emails, not to send emails to your, you know, data to your personal email from your work account. Uh, but all of that, you actually, you, sh you absolutely should be trained on. So you should at minimum expect to be trained on. And uh, I would say that you should refuse to do the task if it puts you and your um, uh, possible um, subjecting to li libel to be sued or to be prosecuted at risk. No, absolutely not. Okay. So does that, does that help? Yes, it does. I was just wondering because of how quickly everybody had to switch over and you know, people were saying, well, there's people taking information at home and it may not be secure and they're trying to work from home, but you know, was it necessarily a secure network and things like that? So I was just wondering about that. Yeah, and, and I'll add, there's there's a lot legislatively uh, that is changing very fast. I just read about uh, there was a hack, you know, over in Europe that um, now is making it where um, those that are victims in uh, breaches, data breaches, are able to bring about lawsuit and class action lawsuit without having to prove that they've lost or they've been damaged. And that is a major paradigm shift uh, for the industry. So everyone should be on alert. Thank you. Thank you, great question. And Nico also said, also isolating your work environment from non-employees, like kids, okay. <laughs> That's our Thank resource. You, everyone. Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> No, no, it's perfectly fine. Um, we are getting into uh, the last couple minutes here. Um, so firstly, uh, thank you so much, Alana and our panelists uh, for coming and for uh, giving us such great information, uh, uh, you know, and some, some resources I didn't even um, include here um, for the folks that, uh, you know, chose to attend. Uh, thank you all so much. You all had a wealth of knowledge that will definitely help um, in regards to uh, not only making sure that we are safe um, for cyber uh, cyber security, uh, but you know just new ideas and ways of uh, talking to our students and thinking about cybersecurity with our students. So thank you all so much. Uh, we really really appreciate it. Um, and with that, you know, since we're talking about resources and how um, you know teachers can uh, uh, do certain things to. Um, gain a further knowledge of cybersecurity. Um, one of the resources that I definitely want to uh, uh, point out, if you look on the teacher focus side, is the online professional development courses that CSTA um, has developed. Uh, I'm going to drop it here in the chat so that you can all access. Um, if you have a CSTA, if you are a CSTA Plus member, um, it is free for you to participate in this course. Um, so I would uh, uh, advise you to go ahead and take advantage of it. 
um, if you can. All right. Uh, from the rest of these resources, I I, I added the uh, the card game from the panel that was discussed as well that wasn't on here. Um, so you know, take a take a minute if you have it to to just look at these things and, and see what you can use for yourself and for your students. And again, I'll drop the uh, overall uh, deck, the link to it um, at the end here. And, you know, so you can have time to look at these resources. Bashir, so, can I share, we're actually hosting a round table in uh, observance of Cyber Awareness Month. Sure. I'm just gonna drop that chat and the link and that's resources that every state and local community should have access to, but there's a two month window to apply for the grant dollars to work with members and organizations in your community to improve your community's cyber resilience. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, you know, and I've worked with Nefeteria before um, and, you know, she supplies really great resources and, you know, just opportunities to learn more uh, definitely about cybersecurity. So if you are interested, go ahead and click the link that she dropped in the chat um, and so you can learn more. On the CSTA side, um, these are some upcoming things that we have going on as far as professional learning series is concerned. Um, so you can see some, some topics for some upcoming dates. Um, and all of that good stuff. Last but not least is an exit survey um, that I am hoping that you can all take. If you are an educator, um, you can see that very last fact there. I'm going to go ahead and drop this in the chat. But that very last fact, once you provide feedback for this event, you will receive a certificate of completion. You can show this to your school administration and it will count as professional development. Um, so go ahead and do that. Um, again, thank you all so much. Thank you to our panelists. You all have been very, very awesome. Thank you to our moderator. Uh, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, and that is it. We are at the um, eight o'clock Eastern hour, the seven o'clock central hour. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to stop recording. Um, but thank you all again. Thank you all so much. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate it. And thank you for all the educators who showed up on this evening. <laughs>